Welcome to the Upper Digestive System. This tutorial is part of a series on the histology and physiology of the digestive system. The broad function of the digestive system is to obtain from food the components the body needs for maintenance, growth, and energy. During digestion, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates are broken down into small units that can be absorbed by the small intestine. The inner layer of the digestive tract also is a critical barrier between the outside of the body or the contents of the lumen in the body, and its structure reflects that function. Throughout this series, we'll discuss the structures within each part of the digestive tract that allow for specific functions. We'll start at the top with the oral cavity and associated salivary glands. I'm Dr. Katherine Moore, and I'm the Histology Wizard. Let's begin with a brief review of the functions of the digestive system. First, we have the introduction of food and liquid, or ingestion. Mastication, or chewing, which breaks down the food into digestible pieces. Motility, or the muscular movements of materials through the tract. Secretion of lubricating and protective mucus, digestive enzymes, acidic and alkaline fluids, and bile. Hormone release, which is important for local control of motility and secretion. Chemical digestion of larger molecules into smaller ones that can be absorbed. Absorption of those smaller molecules in water and finally elimination of indigestible unabsorbable components. The digestive system consists of the digestive tract, the oral cavity, esophagus, stomach, small and large intestines, and anus. It also includes accessory glands such as the salivary glands, liver, pancreas, and gallbladder. This video will focus on part of the upper digestive system, the oral cavity, and the accessory salivary glands. Together these components perform the function of receiving and initial processing of food. In the oral cavity, we'll discuss the epithelium, tongue, and salivary glands, and the ducts, but we won't cover the tonsils or the pharynx. The oral cavity is the entrance to the digestive system. As such, it's the primary barrier to pathogens. Ingestion, partial digestion, both mechanical mastication and chemical digestion, and lubrication of the food or bolus are the main functions of the mouth and salivary glands. The oral cavity is not organized in four layers like the rest of the gut tube in part because of its specialized functions. Now we won't be covering all these functions in detail today, nor will we discuss the details of oral mucosa, gingiva, or teeth in this video. We'll start with the general histology of the oral mucosa. So the oral cavity is lined with stratified squamous epithelium, which may be non-keratinized, partially or parakeratinized, or fully or orthokeratinized, depending upon its location and function. Fully keratinized oral epithelium is found in the masticatory areas, such as the gingiva or gums or the hard palate. As you might guess, based upon its similarities, differentiation of oral epithelium, its structure, keratinization, and interface between the epidermis and lamina propria are more like skin. Also more like skin, and unlike the rest of the gut, oral epithelium is embryonically derived from ectoderm instead of endoderm. Like the epithelium of the skin, the squamous cells of the oral epithelium also slough off or disquaminate and are replaced continuously. Unlike the skin, the outermost layers of non-keratinized and parakeratinized epithelia retain their nuclei. This epithelium is a strong barrier to pathogens. Other protective functions of the oral cavity are found in the lamina propria, which contains many lymphocytes and the tonsils. Large numbers of neutrophils enter the mouth and throat daily for protection against bacteria. The lamina propria also contains numerous mixed seromucous glands that secrete continuously to keep the mucosa wet and to lubricate that initial food bolus. The submucosa of the oral cavity rests directly on the periosteum of underlying bone, allowing for its strength and flexibility. In masticatory mucosa, the lamina propria attaches directly to the bone, enhancing its strength. The tongue functions to manipulate ingested material during mastication and swallowing. The anterior two-thirds contains a massive skeletal muscle that is oriented in many different directions, longitudinal, transverse, and oblique, as seen in this micrograph, and this allows for the tongue's great mobility and flexibility. The posterior third of the tongue contains the lingual tonsils. The ventral surface of the tongue is smooth, with typical lining mucosa of non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium but the dorsal surface of the tongue is covered by a specialized mucosa, a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, a lamina propria associated with the muscular core, and many glands. 
The dorsal surface is irregular and contains the massed lingual tonsils posteriorly and anteriorly numerous mucosal projections called lingual papillae. The sulcus terminus is a V-shaped group that roughly separates the lingual and papillary tongue surfaces. The papillae are projections of mucous membrane that have various forms and functions, and there are four of them. Filiform, fungiform, foliate, and circumvallate or vallate papillae. Now we'll briefly examine each type of papillae. The filiform papillae lie on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. They're the most numerous and provide a rough surface that facilitates licking and chewing. These do not contain taste buds, but they have a highly keratinized epithelium that gives them a whitish grayish appearance. These papillae are what allows us to lick an ice cream cone. Fungiform papillae resemble mushrooms and are found throughout the tongue surface, and these do contain taste buds, but they are not keratinized. Foliate papillae are rudimentary in human adults, but are basically leaf-shaped and also contain taste buds. Finally, circumvallate papillae, or wall-like papillae, are found in the posterior part of the tongue in front of the sulcus terminus in roughly a V-shape. These are the largest papillae, and they contain large crypts or grooves seen by the arrow and abundant taste buds in their sides. The ducts of glands called von Ebner's glands empty into the grooves or crypts that surround each papillae. This allows for a continuous fluid flow over the crypts, and it washes them out so that new tastes can be detected. Taste buds are the specialized sensory components of oral mucosa, and they are responsible for sampling the chemical composition of ingested material. There are roughly 250 taste buds per circumvallate papillae, but as noted, they're found in all the different papillae except the filiform. These barrel-shaped structures contain chemosensory cells, gustatory receptor cells, that are in contact with the terminals of the gustatory nerves. This cartoon depicts the basic structure of a taste bud, which contains specialized receptor cells, supporting cells, and basal cells which continuously regenerate the receptor cells, as taste bud receptor cells have only a 10 to 14 day lifespan. The basal portion of each receptor cell makes contact with an afferent nerve terminal, which is derived from the sensory ganglia of the facial, glossopharyngeal, and vagus nerves. Taste buds can detect four basic sensations, bitter or alkaloids, sweet or sugars, salty, sodium, and sour, hydrogen and acids. And a fifth sensation is umami, which essentially detects glutamate. Specific tastes are then generated by taste receptor cells in different combinations. And the signals are generated by G proteins for sweet, umami, and bitter, while salty and sour are detected by activation of specific ion channels, sodium and hydrogen channels. Let's now look at the salivary glands. The primary function of these glands is to make saliva, up to half a liter daily, and saliva contains proteins, mucus, ions, water, and immunoglobulin A. It's a fluid whose important health properties are only beginning to be appreciated. Saliva lubricates, it maintains the integrity of the teeth, it begins chemical digestion, and it serves critical protective function. In addition, it helps in taste and also in tissue repair. You should remember that saliva contains lipase and amylase, which perform the first steps of chemical digestion, and lysozyme and defenses important for protection. These glands can become infected, primarily by viruses, and they can also become impacted, causing swelling and pain. Salivary glands also make haptocorin, a vitamin B12 binding protein that's critical to protect this vitamin in the digestive system. This cartoon shows the journey of vitamin B12 as it moves through the digestive system. Since it is acid sensitive, it must be conjugated for protection against destruction in the stomach. Protein protects dietary B12 until it reaches the stomach where haptocorin produced by the salivary glands will now bind to B12 once it's released from protein. Once it's in the small intestine, haptocorin is degraded by pancreatic enzymes and B12 is protected by intrinsic factor which has been produced by stomach parietal cells. You should be able to predict potential symptoms in a patient who lacks haptocorin. There are three major salivary glands, the parotid near the ear, the sublingual under the tongue, and the submandibular as well as hundreds of minor salivary glands found throughout the oral cavity. We won't go into details here about the specific glands. You'll learn those in your lab learning module and look at examples in the lab, but we will discuss the basic structure and histology of the three major glands. 
Later in the unit, we'll discuss different types of glands. Each major salivary gland has the same basic structure, consisting of a series of branched ducts as shown in this cartoon. The basic histological features of the salivary gland are the secretory unit, or acinus, and the ducts that move and modify the saliva. Now, if we take a section through this structure, we can see that the parenchyma consists of secretory units, or acini, both mucus and serous, and a series of intralobular ducts, the intercalated ducts which connect the acini to the larger ducts, and the striated ducts. We will discuss the histology and function of the acini and ducts in just a minute. The stroma of the salivary gland consists of interlobular ducts that are located in connective tissue. These ducts can converge to form lobar ducts and eventually excretory ducts that merge into one main duct, which will drain each gland into the oral cavity. Let's start with the basic unit of secretion, the acinus, shown here in this micrograph of the submandibular gland. Here we see both mucus and serous acini in this mixed gland. A single acinus can be completely mucus or serous, but serous and mucus cells can exist in the same acinus, making it a mixed acinus. So you can have mixed acini in a mixed gland. Surrounding each acinus are specialized contractile myoepithelial cells, which form almost a basket or network around the acinus, as seen in this electron micrograph. The basal lamina then surrounds both the acinus and the myoepithelial cells. In this H and E stain section, you can see how the myoepithelial cells are thin and surround the acinus, and the second image highlights the myosin in these cells. As their name implies, these cells contract to squeeze the secretory product out of the acinus into the intercalated ducts, which then are also associated with some myoepithelial cells. Thus, myoepithelial cells are a defining feature of the salivary glands. From the acinus, the secretion or saliva moves into the intercalated ducts, which are conduits to the larger interlobular ducts. They contain a simple low to cuboidal epithelium and are longest in the parotid gland and thus easiest to visualize there. There are connective tissue cells associated with these glands that produce IgA, and you should be able to name these cells based on your knowledge of connective tissue. Intercalated ducts merge into the next segments of the intralobular duct, the striated duct. These ducts are lined by cuboidal to columnar cells that contain a basal lateral sodium potassium ATPase whose function is to modify saliva. So saliva starts off as isotonic, but sodium is recovered in the striated ducts such that the resulting saliva is hypotonic. Thus, the epithelial cells of striated ducts function analogous to the epithelial cells in the ducts of sweat glands. Striated ducts can be recognized not only by their higher epithelial cell height, but by their characteristic striated or stripy appearance. This is caused by numerous infoldings of the basal membrane that are packed with vertically aligned mitochondria, as seen in this EM. These striations can even be visualized using the light microscope, as seen in this H&E stain section. Now you'll see when we talk later in the unit about the pancreas that the histology of the pancreas is very similar to that of the parotid gland, but the pancreas lacks striated ducts as they are a defining feature of salivary glands. Next, the saliva moves through the interlobular duct, lined initially by columnar epithelium and later by pseudostratified columnar epithelium. These ducts lie in the stroma of the gland and thus are always found surrounded by connective tissue. These ducts will eventually drain into excretory ducts in the septa between the lobes of the salivary gland, where one can also see nerves and vessels. Finally, here's a useful cartoon that summarizes the histological differences within the salivary gland duct system. That's it for the oral cavity and salivary glands. Be sure to check out the rest of the tutorials on the digestive system. If you prefer to go in order, check out this playlist. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Thanks for stopping by.